I want to give you my passage this morning. Last week, we've been talking on, um, this was like a little two-part mini-series, but not made for TV. It was made for church. And um, I was calling it Managing the Unmanaged. And it's, it's this idea that we all know there's parts of our life that we're not really letting God manage, you know? It's not like, God, what do you want to manage? It's like, no, I know what you're not managing because I got that. Thank you, Jesus. I got that. That's the messy room in your house that you don't show when someone comes over. That's the, that's the closet with all the clothes piled up that you're going to put on the, on, the, on the hangers eventually. But as long as nobody sees it, it's not like it's really there. And you know it's there. You consciously know it's there. And you consciously keep it that way. That's the stuff that we said, if God could come in and manage that too, what could he do to our life? So we made it into two parts. And the, the first part last week was called acquired accountability. Did, did anybody hear it or see it online? Did anybody see the message? Three people saw it. Excellent. That's a great return. That's a great return. I love it. Three people. Just kidding. I know four people saw it. So, so acquired accountability. So it's like this idea that what if you embraced accountability like it was exciting and not a fear? People fear accountability. They fear responsibility. You know, you touch, you buy. We'd rather window shop through life than have to own what it is that maybe we could be in charge of and really do something good with, but we have to really take it in our own possession and do something with it. And if we don't, uh, you know, we just stay the same. And if we do, we risk, you know, change. So it was this whole idea of embracing accountability, not fearing it. And so that's a good thing. So the second half this week is, is to follow up on once we embrace accountability, what God wants to do with us and expects of us. Too much is given, much is required. Let's go to Luke chapter 12, verse 41 through 48. When you got to say amen, you don't got to say amen. If you're using a digital Bible, say amen. And if you're using a real Bible, say crickets. Crickets, see, there's no one with a Bible. I just heard crickets, actually. Verse 41 says, Then Peter said to him, Lord, you speak this parable only to us or to all people? And Jesus said, Who then is the faithful and wise steward whom his master will make ruler over his household to give him their portion of food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find doing so when he comes. It didn't say, Blessed is when he's already with him, he says when he shows up, he will already be doing that which is good. Truly I say to you that he will make him ruler over all that he has. That king is going to do something with that steward when he finds him doing what he was supposed to be doing even when the king is not present. It says in verse 45, but if that servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat the male and female servants, Lord have mercy, and eat and drink and hit the crystal, he says the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and at an hour when he is not aware and he will cut him in two and appoint his portion with the unbelievers. He's going to take what that guy was supposed to get and give it to someone who's really ready for it what he's saying. And that servant, verse 47, who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will, knowing so, he knew it, shall be beaten with many stripes. Now, we're not talking about beating people today. We're talking about losing what God intended for us to possess. But he who did not know, yet committed things deserving of stripes, shall be beaten with few. For everyone, everybody say everyone, to whom much is given, from him, much will be required. Ooh, I just want a window shop my way. And to whom who much has been committed of him, they will ask more. They're so pushy. No, you don't understand. We're trying to pull potential out of you people. God wants to pull potential out of you. And when you see God do it to you, you want to give that to somebody else because everybody has such amazing gifts and talents that God put in them to do something for his glory on this earth. And when you learn that, your mission becomes to pull that out of people because it takes the body together to do it. No one man can do it. And God says, when I've exposed this truth to you and you know to whom much is given, much will be required. And if I have, if you've been committed and you know, then I'm going to ask more because I trust you. Trust you. It's a trust thing. It's a trust thing. My subject today is entrusting 
but trust Ed. And trusting is to invest. It's not just like, I trust you, so I'm comfortable. It's like, I'm investing in you. When I trust you and I entrust into you, because of my trust, I'm investing into you. I had, uh, I didn't know I had such trust issues until I was probably in my 30s, but I had a lot of issues with trust, and it started surfacing in parts of my life. I didn't know I had it, Vince. I didn't know that I had trust issues, and I don't know if it was like um, midlife crisis. It started surfacing. I started doubting people more than ever before, and it got to a point where I just didn't think good of anybody. I thought they were all liars. I thought everybody was a liar in the end. And that I couldn't trust anybody. And, and, and so I, I was always scared to kindle real relationships with people. And I don't, I don't make excuses. But when I was a kid, there's things that, that I did that caused me to get probably teased and do things that would have been a lot easier if I had just been a little not so awkward. But, but it was my own thing. And, and so it, it created this fear. See, when you fear something, you won't trust it. You, you don't put your trust in something that you're scared of. You can be scared by the wisdom of God. That's, a, that's an anticipative fear. But when you're scared, like, I want my mommy, I want to go in the corner because it's storming and, and I want to sleep on mommy and daddy's floor like Taz, that's a, that's a scared fear. That's a different kind of fear. And that's not trust. You run to where you don't fear. And trust is difficult for most of us. As you grow into adulthood and face many situations where trust was broken, it's understandable that you lose faith in people and quit expecting good out of them. It's what you know. It's what's happened. It's the pattern you've seen. Teach a, teach a, way a child they should go, and when they're older, they will not stray from the truth. What they learn as a child is what they will exalt as an adult. And so if they've learned that there is no trust, there is no good, they will fear that as an adult. But trusting God is different. Trusting in God is different than trusting people. So you can love people to death. You can be praying for people and believing for the best for them. But at the end of the day, they have to make their own decisions. And as people, our decisions will not always line up with what we expect out of each other and what God expects out of us. Does that make sense? It doesn't matter how hard I pray for you, you're not always gonna do what I wanted and vice versa. And that's just because we're people. But however, an opportunity to trust God is different. We have this opportunity to trust him in a way that's beyond any type of human sensual comprehension. A trust that has the power to eliminate fear, to eliminate worry and doubt. And a trust that the world can't take away. The world can't take it away like they did. They broke your trust, but the world can't take away a trust that can't be broken by Jesus. And it's different because it's God-touched. It's God-breathed. You can clap for that. That's okay. Because it's the truth. And when you feel like there's no hope left, there's always a trust chain of confidence in Christ. No matter what pill of hell, pit of hell you are sitting in, there is a link to Christ that will not be broken. It can eliminate all your worries. It's essential we must never lose trust in a God that is bigger than our deepest understanding of love here on earth. If you took your greatest, most happiest, joyful thing you can, you can comprehend, probably your children or your spouse or your friends, and you magnify it on a level you can't even sensually wrap your mind of, that's how much God loves us. It's deeper. It's deeper than the human mind can sense. It's so deep. It's uncomprehendable. He, Jesus, desires the same kind of love and expects the same kind of love from us to him. We were made in his image. If he loves us that much, why couldn't we love him that much? We could, but it's a trust thing. And God want you to trust him and being we're, we're talking about being good stewards here in this this mini series and being good stewards with what God has assigned us elevated us and blessed us with God needs to be able to trust y'all he needs to be able to trust us as we declare our faithfulness in all that we do God will change the playing field in our life but if we declare it here and don't declare it here 
something's out of line, you know? God is waiting. Everybody say he's waiting for your complete and unwavering trust in him. Unwavering, complete. That's why we preach praise and worship. We preach, we preach to praise along because when God can open up your heart by your mouth and you praise, the Bible says if he can get your mouth, it's like steering a ship with the, with the rudder. It's like, it's like taking over a horse by the bit in his mouth, that the tongue is the most unruly member of the body. And if God can get your mouth, he can get your life. So when you decide to praise him, you decide to cast out the devil. You decide to cast good seeds. And now you are actually conquering darkness around you because you're preaching in the word of God to the situation. But when you speak nothing, the devil says, that's good. That's what I want. You keep telling yourself, you just think about it and that's enough. And God says, no, even the demons knew who I was and believed that I cast into the swine, that the possessed man said, go into the swine because I'm, I'm, he's making me crazy. They believe that he was the Christ too. But active faith has movement and takes action. So belief and action is what he wants to see. And that's when your mouth aligns with your heart and your actions. Otherwise, it's just this. Truly, I know that's like transparent and like honest. I thought I just came to get a pat on the back, but I love y'all. That's why I'm telling you about this. Because if I didn't care, I wouldn't be here. I mean, I got a life too, but I love y'all. And it's become a mission to let you know the truth because you got to give it to somebody else. You got to give it to somebody too. For everyone who to whom much is given, it says from him, much will be required. I know the truth, and I know what the Bible says, and I have to give it, and I want to give it, because I know what God would do, would do with it. Too much has been committed, of then they'll ask more. Elevate me, God. Take me somewhere I never wanted to go. I just want to be Stevie Ray Vaughan, God, or Janet Jackson, or a mix of the two. But he said, no, you're going to be a preacher. I'm going to do something more useful, even though it is cool, says Jesus. It was cool. You want to be Stevie Ray Vaughan. Who, why wouldn't that not be cool? Anyway, I digress. Hey, Damon, I think that gate's a little strong. Techie talk. Sorry, guys, got to do it. But what is the number one thing stopping us from really trusting God? It's control, right? We got to give up. We have to give up control. And why don't we like to give up control? Because it's a trust thing. If you're not confident in something, you're not going to trust it. If you're doubting that's a lack of confidence. You're not going to trust it. And you're not going to fully trust God until you're confident that he really has your best interest. That he really wants to make your life better. But sometimes it's easy to stay comfortable doing the same things to keep it, you know, going through the motions. But you weren't meant to go through the motions. The Bible says you are more than conquerors when you're in Christ. And a conqueror doesn't just float through the motions like a bump on the log. They go through and they share the good news in a way that touches lives. And that's where joy comes. That's why you can laugh at church. That's why you can be excited for church. I get a little crazy on the guitar sometimes because I just got to move. Because I know what God is doing. And that creates joy. And that's a good thing. I'm not saying it's got to be whatever I do. I'm just saying let it out. It was meant to come out, whatever it is. And confidence creates trust. And my lack of confidence is, is really a fear that I have. And it's, it's a fear against maybe my own actions, what I might do in certain situations. And more so in this culture, it's a fear of what somebody's going to think of me. If I really serve the Lord, they're going to think I'm an old Dana Carvey church lady. Satan? That's not the Bible. You're supposed to mingle with your brothers and show them the difference. But I'm not going to go wherever you go because I don't want to get burned. Because I'm bringing the light of Jesus with me. So you can meet me in the middle and I'm going to show you the difference. Y'all, the team lead, you remember the candle trick? We did the candle trick in my house. Who was in here for that? We're talking about sin and we don't really talk about sin that much. But I lit a candle and I took a little piece of paper and I showed them that this is just me digressing because I'm on the fast and that's what I do, is, is I showed them that the piece of paper can get really close to the fire and the piece of paper is you. And, and you don't say, I'm going to go jump in this burning candle today. I'm going to jump in this flame. And the flame represents sin, obviously. And, and so you get close enough to the flame and it was just a matter of seconds, the fire all of a sudden leaped out at the paper. Y'all didn't think about that, did you? You know, you, can't, you can only co-mingle with certain things before they influence you. 
You can only do what everything the world does before that influences you to become like the world. You were called to be a difference and set a different tone. It doesn't mean you don't love those people. It definitely doesn't mean you hate the people. It means you love them because you're trying to show them the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus. So the point of the candle illustration was that you can't mingle in those territories and get too close because you will be consumed. It's just a matter of when. So you have to create boundaries in your life when you're trying to serve God. It takes a conscious effort to do things different. So try it sometime, but if you set your house on fire, don't tell you I told you to do it. We put our confidence in social media. We put our confidence in this facade of what people think looks good, but in the inside, we're empty. And I can preach real good on social media, but if my life doesn't match it, I'm a fraud. Because no one's really listening. They're only thinking about what they're going to say back. So they look good too. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a mirage. It's a facade. The real, the real penetration of hearts happens outside the digital world. It's just a catalyst to get them here. You think I love posting three times a day on 15 different social networks? No, I don't. I do it because I want people to come in this house. And if I can get them in this house and I can get this word in them, God will give the increase. God will do something different. But I got to play the game and say, look at how cool it is. Look, look, oh, the animated thing with the pressure, Jeff, and the thing is so cool and everything. And it's not about me. But I play the world's game to get them to know Jesus. And I believe we're on our way. I believe it. A friend of mine posted on social media. This was really funny. He said, if it's not on Facebook, does that mean it didn't, didn't happen? <laughs> If it's not on Facebook, does that mean it like, didn't happen? <laughs> I just, I thought it was funny. And I'm guilty. I'm guilty of it. Except I don't do the duck faces. I don't, I don't do the duck face. I quit that when I turned 40. Anyway, it's about control. And when you don't give God control, that means you're trying to be in control of your destiny. And so when your life's not going how you expect and how you want, it's because you're really trying to drive the ship yourself. But God says, I got to drive the ship with your mouth. Starts with your mouth, starts with your body. When I can take the ship over, then I'm really driving. But until I have full control, I'm not really driving. You're driving and I'm just a passenger on your boat. It's deceptive to ourself. It's a trust thing. The enemy loves it. The enemy loves it when people just say, I'm just going to do it this way. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, what do you call it, put it in the Christian care package. I'm going to pull out the bits of, of my walk with God the way I want it. I'm going to put it in this box, and I'm going to say, that's my version, 2.0. That's my version of Christianity. But the Bible is the Bible. But this is my thing. But the Bible is to lead and guide us into all truth, you know, and, and we can't stray from that. And so the devil loves it when we make these assumptions, and then we go preaching the false gospel. Now we've made our own gospel, and we start preaching it to somebody else, and we start sending them down the wrong street and so and so the enemy loves it it's like our flakiness you know like 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 what's the newest trend let's do the newest trend let's let's bounce but you can't build roots if you're bouncing let's change jobs again oh i don't like this this is hard yeah it's hard that's good you want to be challenged because if you keep working at something that's hard guess what happens it becomes easier but if it's always hard let's bounce oh i just ripped up the root that was starting to grow I was just starting to get somewhere and I ripped it out and I went to the next place of convenience and complacency because it's just more familiar and I'm good with it. It's enough. And I can be the light of the world on my couch doing nothing. No, you can't. No, you can't. And you won't be happy that way. We said it last week, you'll be spiritually lethargic. You got to circulate your blood and move and you will find fulfillment on a level you've never experienced God says, quit bouncing and stick firm in something. Go all in. It's not a show. Well, I'll just go to this church or that church. Or I'll just do that or this, or this. Find somewhere you believe in the mission and root in and go all in while you have air to breathe. It goes quick. My daughter's turning 10 in March. She was just born. She's turning 10 in March. I'm 41. Nine more years. I'll be 50. That just sounds weird. I can't believe I spoke that. If I figure if I don't speak it, it's not true. But the, 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 it's truth, people. It goes fast. And quit waiting on God to show you. I'm just resting in the peace of God and waiting for him to show me the way. And he's saying, God, I already showed you the way. It's at once in church. I'm biased. I mean, I should be. I should be. Or we wouldn't have this church. If I didn't think this church mattered, I wouldn't have planted it. I would have gone somewhere else. 
But I believe there's a difference and there was a reason that God had us planted. So I'm trying to impart that mission into you guys. So you feel what I feel and we feel it together. We will light this community up. But it takes trust. And God is waiting for your complete and unwavering trust. I had this old friend, Michelle, you remember? This is my wife, Michelle, if y'all don't know. She does computer. Give it up for Michelle. <laughs> she doesn't like being in the, so I call her out, you know, to be funny. And she doesn't, she's all right with it now after two years. But remember Mark? Remember, oh, I wasn't supposed to say his name on the recording. Sorry, guys. So we'll, we'll cut that out. You know, remember Mark? I had this friend Mark and um, I grew up with, and every time I'd see Mark, he'd have a new girlfriend. Or he didn't, no, he didn't have a new one. He didn't have the one he had last time I saw him. <laughs> That's what it was. And it's like frequent. And, and I'd be like, and he, he reminded me of, he was like a skinny Rocky. He was into karate, not boxing. But he talk like this. And I say, hey, Mark, um, what happened to the last girl? Oh, she was crazy, man. She was psycho. I was like, really? Just like the last four before that. That's so funny. I, I, I think finally I said, do you ever think it might be you? You think, you think maybe it's, maybe it's you? Maybe it's you because you, see, you won't commit to nothing because you know that takes accountability. That's like, I can't window shop anymore. We're talking about you touch, you buy in the convenience stores. You touch, you buy. I got to own it. And so I don't want to really invest in a relationship because I got to be committed. Then Yeah. Did you know, I don't want to, we're starting relationships next week. But do you know why pain, you get so much pain when someone breaks your heart? Because it wasn't meant to happen. That's not how God designed it to be. You're supposed to be committed. When you get in a relation, rela he had relations with him. You know, you know, you know, you know, nutty professor. When you get, in, when you get into a relationship, not, I'm not talking about just sexual, but a relationship with people and you open up your heart, it wasn't meant to be broken. So the world has changed things. So you just bounce around. Hey, one over here, one over there, one over here. I never build any roots, but I'm still miserable. But see, God never meant for you to have a broken heart. He meant for you to commit to what you do. And it was built upon the rock of Jesus. It wasn't, you weren't meant to feel that pain. And I've been there and I know what that feels like. And it's awful. And that's when I've strayed from the gospel. Amen to that. That's for next time. But Mark, yeah, he, he, the point of talking about Joe, his name's Joe. The point of talking about that is that he never built any roots he just bounced. He was, he was a bouncer. And so I see so many people bounce. They, it's, it's never enough. There's never enough of this for me. And I just wasn't getting fed. And I didn't like what was on the table. And, and they spoke too loud. And they did this. And, and, and then I don't want to bother because it's windy. And I don't want to do this because it might snow in 2021. And I don't want to go to church in 2020 because it might snow in 2021. And I just don't want to risk it. And I don't want to do nothing. I'm just going to st keep staying on my couch. God can't root in their heart. It takes Time, consistency, seed has to root. It has to root. It means you have to stay in the garden, keep tilling the garden and let it root. And God will use your godly investments that you do in secret through trusting in him to publicly bless his house. You don't just start in the public of doing good things for God. It starts with what you do in secret. The king said, if he's doing what I said when I show up, then I know he can be trusted. So if he can be trusted, I'm going to invest in them. That's who I'm going to invest in. Not the ones I only see doing good when I'm with them. I want to know that they're doing good. They're doing what I ask when I'm not with them, says the king. The king is Jesus. Guilty. Private investment into, into your walk with God will lead to public exposure, God's promotion system. He will bless you publicly and privately, but it starts when you're by yourself. And that's the hardest time to do it. That's the hardest time to stay upright is in isolation. Um, you know, they, they talk about solitary confinement. We went to Alcatraz once and it was freezing and I wore a t-shirt. I didn't know it was like 10 degrees felt like it. They're like, you should bring a jacket. I'm like, no, I'm good. And I got on that boat. Holy cow. If cows are holy, I was freezing. So we got, we got an Alcatraz and you know, they got like solitary confinement and you know, they say what, what, what destroys a man in solitary confinement is the isolation because he's trapped with his thoughts 
And when the enemy can get you in a space where you're trapped with your thoughts and you're good at producing thoughts you don't like, the enemy is like a vulture in your garden. So that's where you have to remember the word. You have to take this message with you because it feels good when you're surrounded by supporters. But when you're alone is when you need to remember God's trust system cannot be broken. He wants to entrust those he can trust. And if he can trust you in isolation, he can trust you for anything. And just because the king is away doesn't mean it's time to compromise our faith. Party on Saturday. Go to church on Sunday. Part I'm not criticizing. I'm trying to give you guys an illustration that Jesus has given you the ability to live strong through him without anybody's hand holding you. You've been empowered. You have an opportunity to be empowered by the spirit of God who can do all things through you once you, he is in you. And that takes a fresh start. And it's the hardest to remember that. Even, even the saved in Christ will stumble. But God will put a hook in your mouth and yank you right back out when you become born again. And, and it's those moments of isolation, the old habits come back. The old thoughts come back. And, and you start thinking about like, Maybe I should go back to that person. You know, they kind of treated me good. They made me feel valuable. Maybe I should go back with that crowd or our friends. And, and, you know, I'm feeling weak because I haven't had any meat. And I had to go to Crazy Bowls and Wraps and get a wrap. Uh, no, no leaven, no yeast. And, and get no meat. It was like some lettuce and some jalapeno, and I felt weak. And so I said, okay, God, just take me back to whatever I can do to feel comfortable. I was like, woe is me, Joe, but yesterday night at Crazy Balls. It was bad. I know it's weak, but it's true. I wasn't that bad. But if I get in isolation or you get in isolation and the devil gets a hold of mine and you entertain his foolish lies because he's the father of it, He'll work your mind into drifting backwards. So it's even more important when you are in isolation to remember the good things God has done for you. Remember what Paul did in isolation. He only glorified God in the worst of circumstances. And God is waiting for you in isolation, in public, in private, in all scenarios to have your complete and unwavering trust. And that is the window in that isolation when the devil becomes the distractor. He wants to derail you with distraction because if you're, distraction, you, you're distracted, you can't focus on what is good. And when I'm distracted at church, I get distracted. And you, you, me and Andre joke because I got two faces. I got like Pastor Jeff face and I got like Pastor Jeff face. <laughs> it's a joke because we, we, we hustle in the mobile setup. We, we hustle. And so me, me and Nate and, and the setup team, it's just like boom, 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 boom. We're not really thinking. We're, we're in muscle routine at that point. And then when it all settles down, we, we become this other person. But the distraction will make you look different to others. That's what I'm trying to say. The distraction will make you forget what is good and make you only think about the things that hurt. The distraction will cop stop you from going forward and make you just stand still or even start stepping back because here comes that fear again. The devil says, you really want to eat that apple? God says you can eat any tree. Did he really say you die if you eat that apple? See, he's been doing this game to people since the, since the garden. You can eat that apple. I don't think you'll die. Come on. Come on, Eve. Come on, just blame it on Adam, you know, whatever. That's how God does. He, he tricks your thinking. He gets you in isolation. He, I mean, the, the enemy. He gets you in isolation. He tries to prey on that, that stinking thinking. I think we did a sermon on that. We talked about stinking thinking. When you get isolated, you want to drift back to stinking thinking, but stay upright in isolation. And when you get in public, you'll be strong as a lion. Okay? It's a mind game. People tell themselves, I'm not good enough. When they get in isolation, they start thinking about all their problems. They start thinking about all the people that have hurt them and why they'll never be qualified to do anything good for God. And they keep themselves toxic, intoxicated by stinking thinking. They keep themselves toxic because they won't leave that frame of mind. And it's hard to trust, which you can't focus on. No pain, no gain. That's true to some degree. We used to hear that in uh, weightlifting. No pain, no gain. I'm thinking the few times I felt pain is because something was broke. I don't want to feel that kind of pain. It's that leg day. That's some pain the next day. 
especially if you got my chicken legs, Dave. But spiritual growing pains equal godly gains. Gains. You got nice gains, bro. Dude, you've been working out your spirit. You seem like an anointed one for God. You got some good godly gains, bro. That's right, I have. I don't fear no one because I know the power that is in me can conquer anything. Even if this flesh dies, I got a power that will defeat all darkness. And that power is available to any one of us. That's what we called becoming a Christian. It's godly gains, but you got to change something. Where you are willing, God will meet you. God won't drag you. God will meet you. God desires to use you, but it requires a desire to be different. You got to want to be different to get used different. It's like, you know, real good pastors have a six pack. So that's why I thought one of these days I'll have the preacher pack. It's a joke, people. It's just a joke. It's a joke, okay? But I keep eating that peanut brittle. I keep eating the peanut brittle. We can't talk about it. Like what son calls them rabs. They're abs, Colton. They're abs. They're not rabs, okay? Dad, he's, he sounds like a man. He's, he's, what is he, seven? Check out my rabs, Dad. He talks like a man. But you can't get the preacher pack eating a peanut brittle that we get at the lake every time we go and we hit the same place we were talking about you touch you by we get the peanut brittle you can't get the preacher pack if you're not willing to change something you can't change something in your life if you don't take action and do it different you keep hanging out with the same people keep dating the same type of people keep talking like you talk keep listening to them keep putting that junk in your head you keep you keep getting the same garbage thoughts in your sleep all that stuff you got to till the garden and you'll see godly gains because you're spiritually growing and that's a growing pain like a, like a woman in travail for labor, the baby is growing in the womb. Sometimes you got to lose those fake friends to gain real ones. I don't really, I just like them patting me on the back. I don't like them telling me what I need to hear. We are just talking about that. Real friends tell you what you need to hear because they love you and they care about you. Real friends lift you up. They don't, they don't get fearful when you get further along the corporate ladder or whatever than you do or the, the culture ladder they lift you up they want to see you succeed so sometimes you gotta go silent for a bit and lose the fake crowd to gain the real crowd that loves you and maybe it's just two real people you get in your life that really care about you more than the 50 fake ones on facebook that don't really give a rip because they're not calling you when you're sick they're not calling you when you're depressed they're not texting you to see how you feel you want people who lift you up. And I, don't get me wrong, you can have, I'm not against Facebook and all that, so we're on it. But I'm just saying, real relationship take root in person. And sometimes you gotta, you gotta lose the fake thing to gain the real thing. You gotta lose the crowd of emptiness because that's really what it is. It's a crowd of emptiness. That's when God can start completely and unwavering investing in you because you quit wavering your trust in him. See, he's entrusting or investing in the trusted. To whom much is given, much is required. To whom much has been committed of him, they will ask more. Oh, Vincent, can you go do that too? Oh, Vincent. Hey, Vincent. Hey, Vincent. You know why Vincent gets asked to do so much stuff in this church? Because he's trustworthy. Give it up for Vincent, somebody. Come on. We got a ton of people like that. He can be trusted. He's got the church's best interest in everything he does. There is no question about it. I know that if I was in danger, Vince, Vincent would at least trip the enemy. He would at least stick his leg out or something. Uh, you're going to die. I'm out of here. Maybe you trip him. I don't know. But no, I love you, Vincent. And we got so many people like that. And that's why it's so cool. Your desires will change. Y'all can stand with me as we close this morning. When you, when you really get into this trust thing, you know, God doesn't desire you go through adversity, but God uses his adversity. We hear it all the time. Why did God do this? And I say, I don't, I don't know that God did it, but God used it. And there's a difference. Sometimes we do it to ourselves, blame it on God. Sometimes we do it to ourselves, blame it on the devil. Sometimes 
We just, we're looking for someone to point at. But God will bring good from it. And when you go to this place, your, your definitions will change. Your life definitions will change. You'll pray in place of partying. Your joy will change. Real joy rejoices all day, not just at night. It's in the morning too, because joy, joy comes in the morning. Joy comes all the time. And God will change your definitions of what real joy is, real fulfillment is, through the entrusting process. And what you define as fun will change. And what you define as happy will change. And what you define as important will change. And what you define as priority will change. It'll no longer be, I have to. It'll be, I get to. Wow, thank you, God. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. I just want to know, let's everybody bow your heads right now. And I want to ask a question and close your eyes and nobody's looking. But if there's somebody here that is just on the fence of really giving full submission of trust, just raise your hand. No one's looking. Just let God know. Good, good. Raise your hand. It's okay. No one's looking. Give God full control. You need a fresh start. You need a fresh start. Paul says, I die daily. Just because I died and I messed up doesn't mean I can't start again. I will go again. This message is for you. This message is for you. If you want real change, you got to do it differently. You got to go about it God's way. Go all in for Jesus and watch something change like you've never experienced. Let's pray real quick as we continue to fast as a church. We're praying for vision for 2020. We really believe that 1C Church is going to penetrate St. Charles County in a way this year that nobody knows what to make of it. They're just going to be standing there going, what is this church doing? We believe it matters. We believe something is happening. We believe lives are being changed and we're going to keep on the mission. And God, we ask right now that you put your hand on all those who raised their hands and all those who didn't raise their hands, that you put your hands on everybody. Everybody is your sheep, God, and they need you on a level that they've yet to experience because as they commit to such, you will ask for more because you're raising the bar on your purpose for their life. And you've got this perfect plan that we all have to achieve and we want to do it together as the body of Christ God we ask that this week we remember this word when we get back in that situation when we think that stinking thinking again that we say no I'm not talking about them no more I'm not talking about that junk no more I'm tired of that being in my brain I'm going to think about good things I'm going to think about the people who love me and I'm going to remember what you did for me on the cross and that no what no matter what comes my way this week I've got hope in Jesus Christ and if the house of God could say in Jesus name amen